Okay, great. Now we will have uh, Judy Sells from Harvard to tell us about quantum approximate phase in computation. Hi, I'm Judy. Thanks for the invitation. Um, as you might realize, my title is entirely different from the one that's uh, in, in the abstract. I was going to talk about SYK model because it was in the sort of uh, abstract. Um, so if anyone came to see me give a talk about the SYK model, please talk to me afterwards. I can give you the five minute, like two minute gist of my other talk. It's that basically we figured out finally how to define uh, Wigner functions for fermions. Uh, sounds like a very trivial thing to do. Uh, it took us a very long time. I mean, you naively think you can just generalize normal coherent states for bosons to coherent states for fermions, define Wigner functions, and you're done. Uh, obviously, that works, but it's very dumb because uh, you don't gain anything by simply using normal coherent states for fermions. And so it took us a very long time to realize there's actually a clever way of doing it which allowed us to solve the SYK model in some semi-classical limit, and it turns out that actually if we compute the Apunov exponents from the semi-classical analysis, they agree with all diagrammatic calculations uh, and exact diagonalization of the model. So that would, that would have been the other talk. So if you're interested in that, please please talk to me afterwards. But Eugene convinced me to, to give a talk on our, our, our latest work, and it's entirely different. Uh, and so the, it's about quantum approximate Bayesian computation. It's going to be a very physics-y talk, uh, unlike the other SYK talk. Uh, and the problem is the following. So we got approached by some, some people from Harvard Medical School, essentially, and they came to us with, oh, there's all this big fuss about quantum computing. Uh, it looks like you guys can solve all problems in the world now with these quantum computers. But we have a lot of problems in medicine, uh, and so can't you guys help us solve some problems? And they thought the following problem might be interesting, is that what has been used a lot in, in medical sciences is NMR. Uh, basically, you do NMR spectroscopy on chemical compounds. Uh, so maybe this is an example, this is a compound, this is its NMR spectrum. Uh, and the task usually is you get a spectrum and you want to infer from this spectrum what the molecule is. And it's extremely important because uh, in contrast to like mass spectrometry or x-ray or whatever thing, other thing you want to do, NMR is non-destructive. So you can basically do it on living things, right, which is important in medicine. And so there are certain problems which, for example, have to do with detecting metabolites from cancer uh, that basically only NMR can do. But as you might imagine, the problem is kind of complicated because you're only measuring the spectrum of the nuclear spins inside uh, a molecule, and you're trying to infer essentially the chemical structure of that molecule, right? So that's like totally different scales. You're trying to infer the chemistry of this thing through the resonances in the nuclear spins. Uh, and so they asked us, like, uh, basically I can tell you how it's solved today. You do like uh, thousands and thousands of control experiments on any compound you think might be in your problem. You measure the NMR spectrum of these purified compounds and then you just search. Uh, if you do an actual experiment, you just try to match the patterns, right? So it's a pattern matching problem. But the problem with this is you'll never find a molecule that you've never seen before. Uh, one. Two, if the chemical conditions of your environment are slightly different, then you will also not find the actual molecule because it will deform your spectrum. And so they told us that basically what they want to do is come up with some way of from first principle doing this inference problem. And so the rest of the talk will be about explaining how we think you can use a quantum computer. So I'll explain some algorithm uh, to kind of extract a fake, an NMR spectrum for a fake hypothetical molecule, and then we're using Bayesian inference to kind of infer what the parameters are. And there's maybe some, I mean, there are definitely some interesting mathematical problems. So maybe I'll talk about those. So 
Okay, NMR in one slide. I mean, everybody knows, I guess, what it is. So basically, you take one of these molecules, you put it in a very high magnetic field. This, of course, causes a Zeeman splitting. Uh, and then what you do is you drive your system with some RF magnetic drive, and it starts to absorb, right? And then you're basically measuring that spectrum. But now you might wonder, if this is what I'm doing, well, since I'm just, for example, always putting a Zeeman shift on all these protons, uh, how will I ever measure information about the chemistry of that molecule if it's just a Zeeman shift? Well, the reason is essentially the, the following. So I took this from Andre Keim, uh, if you've never seen it before. So basically, they, what they just did is put a lot of things like a living frog and this uh, tomato uh, in some cavity uh, and uh, subjected it to a gigantic magnetic field, uh, like orders of 20 tesla. And so what he, the point he was trying to make is that anything is diamagnetic. Uh, and so the thing is that what happens, of course, is that these things can float because the huge magnetic field induces a current in these things. This current introduces an opposite magnetic field, and then, therefore, uh, basically, you can, you can uh, stay inside. You can well, compensate for the force of gravity. And so the question we're trying to ask here is that essentially, in our molecules, do we have a frog or a tomato, right? So we want to do some spectroscopy on this problem. And the reason it works is actually this, right? It's that if you think about the problem, is that when you have a gigantic magnetic field, for example, in this benzene ring, what it does is that there will be a flux going through this benzene ring, these pi orbitals, they conduct electricity, so there will be a current going around, and this current will generate a screening magnetic field for the nuclear spin stage. And you see clearly, Whatever this local magnetic field is that's being generated depends on the geometry and the chemical or electrical structure of this molecule because it's the electrons that cause the current and they obviously know about the chemical structure. So basically part of this structure uh, you can infer because, for example, for this molecule the induced magnetic field on these protons is completely different than this. And so chemists usually call these chemical shifts. Uh, it's shifts introduced in the magnetic field uh, because of diamagnetic screening, for example. Now, and so the thing is that how large are they? Well, they're extremely tiny. So we're talking about parts in, in, in million uh, as compared to the external magnetic field you apply. So if you apply a 20 tesla magnetic field, this number will be 20 tesla times 10 to the minus 6. Right? So uh, very small. Uh, number. Uh, okay, but this is the information we're trying to extract. So now you can already see we need some very accurate way of trying to extract this, this quantity. What is the second thing is, of course, there's still, for example, exchange interaction uh, between, between those nuclear spins, or there could even be just dipolar, direct dipolar interaction. And so what we're going to try to do here is simplify the problem a little bit by simply defining the following effective model for our nuclear spins. And uh, it's a Heisenberg model with some couplings that are yet unknown. And there's this local chemical magnetic fields H. And the task is, given that I see some NMR spectrum, find me the J's and the H's that describe this spectrum. So basically, that's the inference problem figure out what the, the J's are and the H's are given that you see a certain NMR spectrum. Uh, and so you could say it's like Hamiltonian inference or Hamiltonian learning, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so clearly there exists a likelihood function for this problem, right? Given that I know the J's, I know the Hamiltonian, there is a well-defined NMR spectrum then, so I can compute in principle the likelihood. But computing this likelihood has to go through solving essentially the Schrodinger equation uh, to compute what the actual NMR absorption is. And so this is the part we'll try to solve on a quantum computer. Um, so one extra slide uh, is that the following quantity is what we're interested in. Uh, it's the response function S of t. Because we're doing NMR, basically even if you have a 20 Tesla magnetic field, if you put in the g factor, uh, of the of the nuclear
nuclear spin, it's so tiny that actually you only get a, a frequency of order of, let's say, 900 megahertz, but room temperature is like 40 terahertz or something like this. So if you're thinking about doing NMR on a normal molecule at room temperature, essentially your experiment is going to be at infinite temperature. Uh, so the thing you're going to measure is the two-point function of the total Z-magnetization in time. So this is the initial Z-magnetization and then uh, the Z-magnetization at a later time t unitarily evolved under this Heisenberg Hamiltonian. But the ensemble in which you are measuring it is an infinite temperature ensemble for all practical purposes. So the NMR spectrum is simply the Fourier transform of this. And so often people say like, oh, but isn't this like trivial to compute because it's just infinite temperature. That should be very easy actually, it's not easy. And there's even a complexity class defined for this which is called deterministic quantum computing with one pure qubit. So you can map this thing actually on an auxiliary problem, which is all spins are at infinite temperature, but one spin is pure. So you have one pure qubit. Uh, and it's been shown, for example, in this work, I think this was the first one, that this class where you have one pure qubit and all the other qubits are maximally mixed is larger than P, but smaller than PQP, which is anything that can be solved fully time on a general quantum computer. And so there was a later interesting work by Shore uh, and collaborator that they, they showed that actually approximating certain specific type of Jones polynomial of a trace closure of a, well, a certain set of braids is complete for this class of problems. And so even though you cannot prove that this is not in P, uh, actually a variant of this is definitely sharp be hard so uh, but this is unknown but they're the same so uh, today this believes that actually this class is strictly larger than p uh, and so you cannot simulate this on a classical computer in polynomial time and so that's where kind of the quantum computing comes in is that in order to even infer those previous parameters we have to at least be able to simulate this thing and so that's what we'll do and so we found two procedures to try to do it on a quantum computer, and the first one is, well, since we want to measure the Z correlation as a function of time, what we can do is do the following. Well, basically prepare a Z eigenstate, let's call it Z of I, and then simply measure, after unitarily evolving it, measure Z of T at some later time T, right? Uh, and then weigh every initial thing with the initial magnetization M of I of that eigenstate Z of I. That clearly is exactly the same as this expression. But you see that would be extremely naive because that would mean I have to prepare on my quantum computer all these individual eigenstates Z of I. There's exponentially many of them. So it's going to clearly take me exponentially long to prepare all of them. Uh, but this operator Z, it's extremely degenerate. Right? because it's the total Z magnetization. There, there's actually only n plus one possible values this operator can take, even though your Hilbert space is exponential. So that basically means that there are large uh, subspaces, namely, for example, the unmagnetized sector, it's exponentially large. Right? There's exponentially many states in there. And so then we can use the following trick. Instead of doing this, we do the following sample according to the binomial distribution because that's how the magnetization is distributed sample a specific product state with a given z magnetization and now prepare a hard random state in that subsector uh, so that's what this is this is a hard random state then if i would compute this it's exactly the same if i average over this over the har measure for each of these subsectors with fixed magnetization measure the z correlation then weigh this by the magnetization of that thing this is exactly the same expression but now the nice thing is actually we gained a lot because most of these uh, subspaces they're exponentially large but that means that we don't need to really average over this hard measure because basically just taking a single random state will give us already statistics that that's exponentially close to the actual average result 
right? So all the gain is in the fact that we're going to use random states in this subsector to approximate this sum, right? Such that we only need to prepare polynomial amount of states, and maybe if you want to get more accurate result, you need to do a few random states, but actually the error you make is exponentially small if you only do it for one. Uh, and now the question is, of course, well, can you prepare a hard random state? Yeah, clearly you cannot prepare a hard random state. But we can use, and this is the thing, what we're going to do, and I guess this is like one of the, I think one of the few, uh, like real applications for something useful of all these fast scrambling results. Because now we know that if we take an initial product state with fixed C magnetization, and we have a circuit, a quantum circuit, that is scrambling fast but conserves the Z magnetization, yeah, then we can prepare approximately a random state uh, in a time which is logarithmic in the number of bits. Right? So this is kind of the idea. Uh, something pictorially like this. So you prepare some, some product state in Z, uh, then you mix it with some circuit that conserves total Z, right? because we want the Z magnetization to conserve, so either the, the thing is diagonal in Z, or it's like a flip-flop term, right? It just moves particles from A to B. And if you, if you could make some circuit that can connect any two qubits, then you can make this extremely fast scrambling, right? Once you have prepared this, you just, pre you just apply the unitary U, measure the Z magnetization, construct your S of T, do a Fourier transform, and you have your spectrum, right? So this is like a way in a quantum computer to extract S of t in some time which is polynomial uh, in the number of qubits. And if you would count, so the resources you need is actually you need n spins. So if you have n nuclear spins, you need n qubits because there is no extra resources required. Uh, and if you count actually all the gates, you would come to the conclusion that the time you need is of order n squared uh, and then some polylog of n, where the polylog comes from this scrambling circuit. And I guess it's still not entirely clear whether c can be really 1 or has to be strictly bigger than 1. But, uh, yeah? So in the expectation, why is it open? Which ensemble is it? This? Yeah. This was the hard measure. Oh, okay. Uh, over with, in the sector with fixed magnetization, uh, M of I. So that's why I put this I. But this were re so this is formally exact, right? And then we're replacing this average over the R measure by averaging over these random circuits, right? uh, which is not entirely the same. But for this purpose, the because you're only interested in measuring this this one point function now, the the error is exponentially small. <laughs> So this is a procedure which I think is very interesting, at least for experimentalists, because this is very easy to do if you want to do it for a, a, a molecule with 10 nuclear spins that are interesting, then you only need 10 qubits. Uh, and it works in a reasonably fast way. So when doing this, we came to the realization, of course, that so there's still this classical things involved, right? We need to measure this Z magnetization, then acquire some statistics, do a Fourier transform of that thing to get the spectrum. Uh, but I mean, one of the things we all learn is that well, quantum computers should be good at doing Fourier transforms, right? <laughs> That's what they do for sure as algorithm. <laughs> so why are we measuring this thing here and then computing this Fourier transform? on a classical computer. Can't we come up with a better algorithm than even this one? Maybe with some additional resources, uh, such that we can quantize that procedure of, of measuring and, and doing this Fourier transform and immediately extract this spectrum. Okay. Yes. And so that turns out to be possible. So we can do quantum phase estimation. Uh, but in the usual way, when you do quantum phase estimation, you're estimating the phase of a state, right? But in this case, we're not interested in the phase of a state at all. We're interested in the two-point function of the Z magnetization, right? I'm interested in the correlation between Z at time zero and Z at time T. So if we can somehow phrase this correlation of Z and Z at time T in terms of a state, then actually maybe we can do quantum Fourier transform or quantum phase estimation on that thing. 
And it turns out to be possible, otherwise it wouldn't be sitting. Uh, so the trick is to do the following thing. Initially, at time t is 0, the operator we're interested in is z squared, right? It, z 0, z 0. But z squared is, of course, a positive operator. And so now I can do the following trick. Let me purify z squared into a, into a pure state on a Hilbert space that's the square of the original one. And then it will look like the following, right? It's proportional to the magnetization m of i. So these are the Schmidt coefficients of that thing. z of i, z of i. If I trace out one of the copies, I exactly get z squared, right? Uh, as the operator. So what we can do now, yeah, so that's what I just said. So this is the quantity we want to compute. So if I now rephrase it back into what is this on the level of this purified state, well, it's nothing but the Loschmidt echo of this z state, right? Just evolved with time. As long as I evolve the, the, the system forward in time and the copy backward in time, right? Because then one as u and the other as u dagger. But this is easy to do. Right? Uh, and so now we see that actually this can be this can be phrased, of course, as the Loschmidt echo on this purified state. But oh, now it's clear that because this is on the level of a state, we can do quantum phase estimation on that state. And so this is what the circuit would look like. Uh, so we have the system, we have the copy. Basically, okay, we this procedure I'll explain in a second. This is what you need to do to prepare that special resource state z. Uh, and then you evolve one with u, the other with u dagger. But instead of just evolving it uh, yourself, what you do is you define a set of control qubits. And you do controlled unitaries uh, like this. And then if you do a quantum Fourier transform on those control qubits, actually you can show that if you measure the control qubits, the output is directly the NMR spectrum. So that the, the thing you measure is that uh, because this is, a, this is, once normalized, it's a true probability distribution. So you will just get that uh, each of these control qubits defines a bit string. This bit string defines a, a frequency, a discretized frequency. And you will find this specific bit string with the according probability according to the NMR spectrum. So if you would measure this a bunch of times and construct a histogram, you would get this. So there is a procedure to immediately extract it, given that you can prepare this state Z, uh, this resource state. And of course, that still remains to be shown, but because you might already anticipate this, well, you need to prepare this funny and tangled state, right? That might not be easy. Well, but it is. If you check, actually, Z squared, if you compute this, its entropy, if you normalize it, it has an entropy n minus 1 log 2 if plus some additive constant. Uh, so for large n, it's just this, which means that you're missing one bit from maximal entanglement, right? If you would have a maximum entangled state, this would be n log 2. So it, there's one bit somehow extracted uh, in, this, in this state. Uh, and so the idea is, and this seems to work, is that therefore let's try to first prepare a maximally entangled state and project out this one bit of information. Let's extract this one bit out of a maximally entangled state. Um, and so we do it like this. Preparing the maximally entangled state is trivial because you take the system, you take a copy, and you just make a bunch of bell pairs between the two. If I cut it here, it's maximally entangled. And now I want to impose this, uh, this Schmidt coefficients there. And the way I can do it is by imparting a phase on one of the two copies. So if I evolve one of the two copies with a unitary, which no, I didn't write it. So with a unitary u of phi, which does the following thing. So it imparts a phase, and the phase is just generated by the total z operator. So u of phi is nothing but e to the i phi z. Uh, and so it's a controlled unitary. So whether you apply the unitary or don't apply the unitary is controlled by this control bit. And so what happens is actually it's not that hard to show that if you measure the control qubit and you want to get a fidelity 1 minus a to, to make this special state z, then actually what happens is that if you find 
the control bit in state one after the procedure, you will have prepared the state you want. But it only happens with a probability that's very small. But if you want finite fidelity, so fidelity one minus epsilon, the success probability is actually order epsilon. So it doesn't become more unlikely if the system grows. It's small if you want high fidelity, but fixed. Like it's a fixed epsilon if you want a fixed accuracy. So unless you're asking for exponential accuracy or something, then this becomes exponentially unlikely, but for finite accuracy, this success probability is finite. Uh, and so with finite probability, if you run this a bunch of times, you will actually find you have prepared this resource state C uh, by basically simply parking this space uh, on, on half of the system. So if you then count sort of resources, uh, now you need more qubits, right? Because you need twice the amount of qubits uh, plus this control qubit, so plus one, and then plus a logarithmic amount of qubits to do the phase estimation. This is important, actually, that there's only log amount of phase estimation qubits, because if you needed an extensive amount of them, then it wouldn't work. Uh, and if you now count, okay, how long does it take to implement this circuit? It depends a little bit on how you count it. Uh, if you decompose all of these things in individual two qubit gates, well then, then this block alone would already take an extensive time, right? Because my system is extensive, so if I decompose it into individual gates, it's going to be order L or N, right? But if I say that I can evolve this entire system with this unitary in one time because it's physical local Hamiltonian, so I count it as one, then actually the system runs in logarithmic time. Uh, so, but if you count number of gate operations you would need to do, it will be n log n. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this is the second way uh, of preparing, say, this circuit, and then the rest of the the, the problem, which I won't get into, uh, is actually how do we do inference now, right? So we, we basically did what our medical school friends asked. <laughs> we came up with a way to go from a hypothetical molecule, which might not exist, into an NMR spectrum, but now we still need to do the opposite step, right? Is that we still need to say that, oh, if they give us a spectrum, like how will I infer which molecule they were looking at? And so, uh, is there some way that this can be done efficiently? And we put a lot of kind of effort, and it's an extremely interesting problem because it turns out that this optimization problem or inference problem is extremely hard. Uh, much harder than I ever thought before. So most, almost all things we tried in that respect have failed. So for example, if you just try to do maximum likelihood estimation and numerically do gradient descent, it fails because there are essentially no gradients in this problem. Uh, if you do some simplex search or some other type of problem to find uh, method to find these uh, parameters, it also fails. Um, and so the only thing we've been able to come up with that works reasonably well is to really do brute force Bayesian inference. That is to kind of say, I have some initial a priori guess of what the parameters might be, and I'm just going to keep running experiments and update my belief uh, based on, on the new data I'm getting. And of course, that converges, but it takes a, it, it's very slow. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll stop here, given the time constraint. Questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, are, is it possible to uh, make some uh, make some progress towards like the, the me measuring this the z correlation function with a quantum maneuver rather than a full quantum computer? Uh, I think so. One other thing we've been thinking about is that you would have, you could do a Ramsey sequence. So that's a thing. Uh, but it's, that would also be hard on a quantum annealer, I think. Uh, so the, that's why it's actually related to this one pure qubit problem. Is that the one pure qubit you need is to essentially impart this phase on an additional control qubit. And then you measure the solid angle that's being spanned by this control qubit. Um, I don't know if that would be possible to run on an annealer. Uh, I mean, 
in a way, this is very close to being possible to run on a quantum simulator, at least, right? Because you only have to be able to prepare very specific uh, magnetized states. The problem, I guess, is on an unusual annealer, you can only control the total magnetic field, right? You cannot control the total magnetic fields. But if you could control those, then definitely this can, can be implemented. So the main reason we, we came up with this procedure is because that, that this can be done on many current experiments like Google's or IBM's. Uh, this is very easy to do, while the other one with phase estimation is kind of hard. Okay, let's take a look again. Now we have a lunch break. We'll be back at 2.30. Do you have an answer? Okay, don't go upstairs.